Hi, this is Greg Shaw uh, with Golden Code, and I'm here to do part two of our source code walkthrough. Uh, so remember, forward the forward open source project does 100% automated conversion of Progress ABL source code into Java source code. We're walking through that Java source code today, and uh, the in part one we reviewed the business logic class. Um, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between business logic and, or the external procedures in, in the ABL and uh, the business logic classes in Forward. And uh, th this is where we left off. I was just had summarized basically anything that is not emitted as part of the data model or into a frame or menu definition is output to the business logic class. All right, so now we're going to talk about that, uh, the stuff that is the uh, data model objects first. So in, in the data model objects, they, the, the inputs come from two locations. They come from the DF file and your ABL source code. So the add table, add index, add field um, directives in the DF that define the structure and configuration of the tables and fields and index indices, those are, those are used um, to generate DDL. All right, so the table and field DDL will go into one SQL script and the index DDL will go into another. Uh, and then in addition, the table and field definitions will turn into a set of data model objects. And uh, I'll, I'm gonna take you through each of these and uh, hibernate mappings for the, the, the data model objects and how they map to the uh, relational tables. Um, now, this is for your permanent databases, uh, and you'll get outputs for each instance, database instances, uh, or I shouldn't say for each database instance, I should say for each schema, um, you'll get a, a set of outputs. And then the, the uh, temp tables and work tables in your ABL source code also will convert to, they won't convert to DDL because you don't need these get created at runtime, in you know internally in, in the forward runtime technology. So there's not we don't have database tables per se that can be seen in the SQL. So you don't need that, but you do still need the Hibernate mappings and the data model objects um, because those are those are actually used in the source code. And create temp tables handled completely at runtime. There is there's some application. Um, there, there is some, some code in, in the business logic for it, but there's not, uh, you don't get DMOs uh, that, because of the DMOs are, are created on the fly. All right, so let's get through some of, some of the example output, inputs and outputs. This is a DF. It's, it wasn't used in our sample program, that primes.p that we looked at last time, but it, it just shows the example. So here's your add table for the address, a, a table called address, and then fields in that. And you'll see, okay, we're creating a table and we're getting a set of fields and we're using types in this case that are specific to Postgres. Um, earlier, I think I probably didn't say it quite right. You're gonna get, a, you're gonna get scripts for each output database you want to use. But so like in this case, I've got this, uh, this DF is called P2J test and I get P2J test Postgres SQL and I can also get a version for H2 uh, or SQL server um, and we'll generate all of those as part of the conversion process. And so it's automated and you just kind of tell it, you configure the process to, to, for which databases you want to use. Uh, and you'll get SQL scripts that can be executed to cre recreate the structure of the database. Uh, and then down here you'll see that there's some indices um, and we can we can go and look at and see what the results um, we have a separate SQL script that creates that will you know recreate the in index indices for the address table. Um, and this is separated because there you know you may want to re-index I mean, when you're importing, for example, you don't want to create the index, uh, any in indices before you've done all the data import, right? Because it, it just, it's not useful. You create them at the end. Um, so it's, it's separated for that reason. 
All right, so that's for your permanent database. Um, now, of course, we have, there's code in, uh, let me put it here, there's code in your application source code, right, that will define tables, and then we're going to want those to be created as well. Um, but we don't, remember, we don't get SQL for that. Um, actually, you know what, before I show the temp tables, let me show you the data model objects for the database. Uh, so we'll go back to the the uh, to the DF um, and we will show the so here's the ta address table again and then I'm going to show the here's so this is the data model object the interface for the address table all right and it extends data model object which is a what's called a marker interface in Java which just basically identifies a type it doesn't have any actual structure and um, so it it then has this is the structure of the data model object itself everyone you're always going to have um, uh, well, b basically, you can see here how how the fields get created. So we've got the adder ID. Remember, uh, hyphen is not valid in in either as a SQL name or as a Java name or in almost any other language. So we we create it as adder ID, and we're, we've got a getter and a setter, um, and it's numeric. So, it, right, it's an integer, so you, but you can assign decimal types to it or, um, you know, in 64 or integers to it. So that the superclass for that is number type. So, but of course, when you read it, you always read it as an integer. So when you do call the getter, you get an integer back. When you call the setter, you pass any one of three possible data types as specified by the supertype. Um, and, and likewise with, you see street here, right? Um, and text is the superclass of long char and char, uh, sorry, character and long char. So, um, again, same kind of approach for the setter, um, and city and state and so forth. So, you see, all the rest are all character types. And then um, this this inner interface inner kind of um, is where we get this specific behavior. Um, where th that are is specific to buffers, so you'll see here. You know we can get the rec ID, the row ID, check if it's available, check if it's locked, check if it's new, so forth. If it's ambiguous, all of the kind of functionality you would expect to be able to call on a buffer. A lot of these correspond to um, built-in functions in the ABL. Some uh, correspond to um, language statements, right? raw transfer, and copy, <laughs> um, compare, and buff copy, buff compare, all things like that. All, all of those things, create, uh, creating a new record, deleting records, are done on a, on a, super, or a, a super interface that is kind of linked to in, in the data model object interface. And then in the, in the business logic, uh, let's see here. In the business logic, we actually reference that inner buff interface. And so when, when we reference list and we do a create, this is being called on this buffer um, interface. And uh, we, we use a trick called dynamic proxies um, in Java to basically create an implementation, a backing implementation uh, kind of inner class. Um, at runtime, so th that's why in the address class you don't see anything in here, um, because we because it's just implementing this buffer, but we the actual implementation is um, is not is not emitted in the application source code. So we actually implement the address um, in a class called address impl. We implement address as well as a couple of other runtime class um, interfaces and then this is where you actually have your real data so this is the actual record in the buffer if you will right it should look pretty 
And we, we use some, it should be pretty um, obvious, the mapping. We, you know, again, you know, these data model objects are beans, right? So they, they are, they're just Java beans that are mapped by Hibernate to the records in your table. And all the SQL and so forth is hidden behind the scenes and you just get to, to deal with it. Um, in the business logic, you know, again, as with the getters and setters. So in this case, this second, this list set num, we're actually calling the setter. So in the first case, we were calling that inner buffer, basically. In the second case, we're calling the setter itself. Um, and so it gives a nice, clean look in the, you know, and it's very readable and understandable in the business logic, but we hide all the complexity of, of getting it out to SQL and back and so forth. Um, so, you know, you'll see we use some annotations to store off a bunch of legacy data about the, um, about the uh, data model object that maps to ABL, like attributes that can be read and so forth. And then here's some implementation, the actual implementation code is, is here. And again, it should look pretty, pretty obvious. There's one thing that's here in the implementation class not, that isn't in the interface, and that's this ID. Every DMO has an ID, and the ID is basically, it's essentially your rec ID or row ID. It's a 64-bit value that is unique across the database. Um, and, you know, we, we, have, we have some methods to assign and to copy and uh, constructor. And that's, that's basically it. The only other thing is the Hibernate mapping which defines the mapping between um, our column name in the, in the, you know, in, in our table to um, the actual bean property that's in use, right? And whether it can be nullable or not and, and its data type and all of that. So um, these three classes basically are the, that's the DMO and the Hibernate mappings for the, um, the address table in the permanent database. Now, uh, as, as I mentioned before, so we, ha we also support, have full support for temp tables. And if you look at the temp table definition, right, it's got a field nom and an index, and the temp table name is list. Um, in this case, we're gonna create a DMO that is this uh, list one. If there's multiple, uh, we, we, we may have to have since the table names are not necessarily unique, you know, we, we have to differentiate that. It extends temporary, which is, again, this, it's a marker interface here. And, um, and then there's that inner buff class, which extends buffer. Again, buffer is where we get all of our real ABL buffer behavior from, in the, and it's all implemented in the runtime. Um, for temp tables, we do we have a, a, a slight complexity where we have actually a subclass or one or more subclasses uh, because in the ABL you can actually define kind of compatible temp tables with, diff with slightly different uh, features like that labels can be different and s some of this, but they're really they're can treated they're treated as the same table and they can so you can pass them from one procedure to another, and they're defined slightly differently in the two procedures, but they are, it's interoperable. Well, to get that, we basically have these sub-interfaces. Um, and then the implementation class essentially looks a whole lot like the original, like the permanent table implementation class. Again, we're kind of, we're in, in this case, we're implementing the sub-interface, but you, know, you can see the ID. There's the, there, for temp tables, there's this multiplex ID. Um, which um, I'm not gonna, it's beyond the scope of this video. But uh, again, you can see the copy constructors and the, the bean setters and getters. And the Hibernate mapping is, is again, very similar um, as you would expect. So those are the, those are the data model objects. You, you've seen, you've, so you've seen that, you know, to, to bring this back up, you, you've seen the, the DDL, you've seen the Hibernate mappings and the data model objects. All of this is the structure, right, of your database and of your temp tables. Um, and, and all of that is kind of split off out of the business logic and, and not included there. Um, so, which brings us to menus and frames. And I'll, st I'll start with frames. Um, I'm not going to actually show menus, but uh, they're basically the same as frames. So, define frame or a form statement um, or 
any of the frame referencing statements, like a display or an update or a set, or prompt for, these, these things actually define, can define a frame, right? You can define a frame. In fact, the same frame can be defined in about, you know, 40 or 50 different places if you wanted in your, in your source code. And the, com the progress compiler presumably builds a canonical single definition of that frame uh, based on certain precedence rules for how it encounters things in the source file. Um, we do the same thing. So th we create a frame definition with all the static portions of, of the frame uh, that includes the, the exact list of widgets that are there and their data types and um, their widget types and the format and layout of the frame, basically, um, well, at least the order of the records, the, the, the layout really ha happens at runtime. But uh, so we create a frame definition, which is a Java class, and it's named by the procedure name and the frame name, and then the word frame at the end. Um, Create frame and create widget don't have frame definition backings because these are runtime concepts. So that'll end up in the business logic itself. You'll have equivalent frame, pre-frame and create widget statements there. And yes, we do support all the dynamic um, UI stuff. Uh, so let me show this frame definition. Um, going back to, uh, let's see, display primes. We've got a f we've we've got a uh, this statement here, right? Display b dash list dot num, which comes from the buffer, the num field of the buffer, um, with the label prime number uh, ten down. Fine. So we've we've created kind of again. This is one hundred percent automated. We didn't do this manually. We created display primes frame zero. Again, this is an unnamed frame, so we created a frame name from it. It extends this thing called common frame, which is the super interface for all frames. And it's again, it's kind of like that buffer interface for um, for data model objects. It gives you all this access to you know your frame ID and whether it's visible and hidden and sensitive and apply statements and display statements and disable and enable and all of the things you want to do with frames um, basically are are mapped to inter APIs in this interface. Um, so, and you notice we don't implement very much, and we don't need to because it's done in the in the runtime. So, what what is in this definition is the structure of the frame itself. Um, ignore this for now, but essentially we've got this get. This, uh, again, it's kind of bean like there's a getter and a setter and a widget accessor for each um, widget in the frame. So the num widget, in this case, if you're trying to get the data out of it, you'd call get num and you get the integer back. And if you've got a setter, um, you can call it with different forms. We, we provide both the old style integer or int, the Java int, as well as the regular integer and then a, a, a uh, a version that does some data type translation automatically, because um, all of all of the compatibility types are are descended from a base class called base data type. And then, if you want to get the widget itself, the, which is of type fill in widget, you call widget num. So this is basically the definition for that num um, widget in that frame. And then we have this sub. This this inner class, it's a static inner class of this interface, and it's the it's where the definition of the frame exact the the kind of internals of it exist. It extends this widget list, which is part of the runtime, and here's the actual num widget, and then there's a setup method that configures it with its data type and its label and and so forth, and we set down to ten on the frame, and we add the widget into. The, so basically, and this is how we kind of expose an instance of that, um, where we expose that class, that static class, I should say, um, to the runtime here, and it gets, and this, it will essentially, it will create, it, it will access this class and call setup on it, which will basically, every time we need a new instance of the frame. 
And the rest of the frame itself is created at, at, by dan dynamic proxies at runtime, so we don't need an implementation for all of these methods. We implement it in the runtime completely, so it, it keeps it simple. Um, so so that's, that's how frames work, and uh, menus basically work the same way. It's just define menu and define submenu and all of the menu items that go inside these. They turn into menu definitions and submenu definitions in a very similar way. A little simpler than frames, but it's basically the same idea. I don't have an obvious uh, an example here for you, but I think you'll get the idea. Anyway, uh, the, the whole point of this is we are we're extracting those things that can be safely extracted, which is typically about structure and layout and, and things that are static definitions, and we move those into separate classes where we can. Um, and where we can is defined by what can, what can we do to, to better factor the system without breaking compatibility, right? And so we do, we do a good bit of, of refactoring, and again, it's all on an automated basis, um, but uh, we do that, you know, only, only in scenarios where it won't break compatibility. Um, that, that's what I, I had for the walkthrough today. I appreciate your time. Go to beyondabl.com for more information, really for the full story on everything. Um, or subscribe to this channel and, uh, or follow us on social media. And uh, thanks for joining me.